Today I want to talk about art and architecture. Now, I'm not going to, in one 45-minute lecture, let you know everything there is to know about Japanese art and architecture because it's a huge topic. Uh, but I want to start out, this image is what you're going to see tomorrow. At least this is an artist's representation. This is called the Red Fuji from a Hokusai series called 36 Views of Mount Fuji. Uh, it's a, a grand example, I think, of uh, woodblock printing in Japan, and we'll talk about that a little bit. In terms of uh, Japanese art, I want to just touch on the arts of painting, calligraphy, woodblock printing, which this is an example of, ceramics, sculpture, poetry, um, performing arts theater, particularly no and kabuki theater, origami, ikebani, bonsai, architecture, and gardens. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll all pass out at that point. Um, much of Japanese art is linked to the uh, bringing of Buddhism into Japan in the 6th century, from China to Korea to Japan. And so in the 7th and 8th century, uh, Japanese art had really adopted a lot of what had come over from China via Korea. And it wasn't until late 8th and then 9th century that a lot of the basics that had come across with Buddhism began to be reinterpreted according to a uniquely Japanese aesthetic. And so you will see connections between some of the Japanese arts and some of the Chinese arts, but the more you get involved in it, the more you can see that there are very distinctive sort of aesthetic expression that occurs in Japanese art that you don't find in China or anywhere else. But it all found its roots in that, and so there are still similarities. Um, I want to talk first about painting. Uh, Japanese painting is one of the oldest and most refined arts uh, of all the Japanese arts. Second, probably only to ceramics, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, Japanese art typically is done with uh, ink rather than paint, uh, usually. Obviously, there's modern Japanese artists that will use paint. Uh, but uh, ink on paper or ink on silk is much more the traditional uh, view of what Japanese painting is all about. Um, again, developed from Chinese origins, and you can see some similarities between Chinese and Japanese art. One of the similarities you will see is the, um, the per per particularly Asian approach to perspective. Um, Western perspective, what we're used to, is always based upon you know, diminishing line of sight. The old railroad tracks, you know, you look down railroad tracks and it looks like they're getting closer and closer together as they get further away. That's a formal Western approach to perspective, how you tell which things are closer and further away. I showed you an image during the gardens uh, lecture where um, the Japanese, as with the Chinese, perspective is much more based upon layers of sight. You get it a little bit here, you know, um, whoops, where there will be darker and clearer images up close. Other images then will be less defined and, and, and not as dark as they recede into the distance. And so perspective in the Japanese sense and in the Chinese sense is much more a layering and the difference in detail uh, of the images is what gives you a sense of what's closer and further away. It is very different than traditional Western perspective. And some, it, it, I, I think it's quite extraordinary, the skill with which they're able to do this. Um, and so, but we need to, some people have trouble with it. They say, well, it all looks flat to me. Well, that's because we're accustomed to a different approach to perspective. Once you get to under, experience this and understand it, um, I think it's, it's quite beautiful. Again, the early painting that was done in Japan was linked to uh, Buddhist religious uh, images, Buddhist religious painting, various ink washes on landscapes, um, but the things that weren't particularly religious in their, in their representation tended to be natural in their imagery, especially birds, uh, flowers, or scenes from everyday life, you know, common people pulling carts or that kind of thing. The, um, much, of, much of that then, of course, the most modern versions of Japanese art are manga and anime which you may or may not be familiar with. It tends to be a younger audience for that. But those are sort of long extensions, uh, current time extensions from the ancient kind of views of things. There are examples, and here you get, this is a painting on silk of a Western ship, uh, a crane. You know, so they, there are much more um, what you might think as being 
realistic kind of art, in, even in historical painting, um, often you will get this kind of representation, which is calligraphy that I'll talk about in a minute, and then a brush painting of an old man. Um, this combination of calligraphy, which is an art form in its own right, and also of brush painting um, is almost uniquely Chinese and Japanese. Um, they, they do extraordinary work in that regard. The Japanese painting, by the way, is called Nihonga, Nihonga style painting. Um, and then in the 16th century, it started being influenced a lot more, and you see that reflected here uh, on the lower pictures, by modern Western perspective, modern Western uh, imagery, the idea of trying to be more photographic in what you represent, but that's not part of the traditional Nihonga uh, Japanese painting style. As I say, calligraphy is a very high art form in Japan. These are different examples of calligraphy, and down here you get another image of painting. Um, this is kind of small, but it's actually painting of, of flower petals, and then calligraphy over top of it. Um, this is called a C C E C G um, C G. Excuse my my pronunciation. Um, the which is means literally the artistic writing. It's the artistic representation of Japanese characters using brush and ink. Um, the Japanese have always used brushes to write with, not pens, and so that's why one of the reasons calligraphy, that is brush work letters, has always been very important to them. And even modern Japanese. Uh, children are often taught calligraphy in uh, school. We were in one of the museums recently, and they had um, a here in Japan, and they had a an interactive area, and the guides were leading these Japanese kids in doing calligraphy, and they had brushes for them and ink and papers, because the Japanese believe that it's very good for children to learn to sit down and sit still, and then practice calligraphy that it is a, a, a calming influence, that it's good for them, in addition to the fact it may help them develop what they consider an art form. Um, they even have, in high schools in Japan, they have competitions in what they call performance calligraphy. Uh, I don't know if it's a speed thing or a you know, quality thing, but they, they, it's, it's, calligraphy is still a very big deal among school children and people. Um, it was very much influenced by, and it very much then influenced, Zen Buddhism. Um, the sense is that for a calligraphy artist who is, who is also practicing Zen meditation, and Zen means meditation, to sit in front of a piece of paper and realize that you only get one chance with a brush and ink with that piece of paper. You can't erase it, you can't start again, that you, and so you will see a calligraphy master, a Zen master who's, who does calligraphy, really sit and meditate over a piece of paper as to how they are going to approach this with a brush and ink in terms of a calligraphy project. Um, as I say, you don't get a second chance on this. You might take another piece of paper, but um, the, the idea is that this is a meditative process. It is an art form. You have to decide how you're going to approach this before you get into it. Um, so it requires a clear mind. You know, the, the, They will work to clear their mind so that the letters then, as they would describe it, will flow onto the paper, that they will be unforced, and that the brush will, on the paper, reflect kind of a spiritual connection rather than just a physical connection. So for them, calligraphy is very much a meditative art. Um, and they will often practice calligraphy. Uh, they'll go through a, a, an exercise of shoda, as it's called, before the tea ceremony because it is a way of, of clearing the mind, of centering oneself in preparation for the meditative act then of the tea ceremony in Japan. And so that's one of the reasons calligraphy is uh, not only a high art form, but a highly valued sense uh, in terms of something people can practice that will improve them as people. Um, it's it's as, as serious as that to them. Japan has also always been at the forefront of woodblock printing. Um, now, this, there's two kinds of printing uh, that I'm referring to there. One is the printing of words. The, originally, they would carve the letters into woodblock in order to print books. And that may seem like a lot of work, but once you've actually got the carving done, you could print a whole lot more books than you could by sitting down and doing it all by hand. And they would all be exactly the same. Um, particularly, they use that for sutras and mantras. Um, <laughs> 
other kinds of religious writings. Again, almost all of this started with religious uh, association. But then later on, the Japanese actually had movable type a long time before they did in the West. Uh, we believe that in the 11th or early 12th century, they had movable type in, in China. Now it was, for the most part, wooden movable type, but they could rearrange the letters. That's what movable type means, in order to be able to print different things with the carved letters. That's a long time before the 16th century when you get Gutenberg uh, doing that, okay? The 15th, 16th centuries. So, um, but in addition to the printing of words for various uses, they, the use of water-based inks to create um, image, art images like this one. This is a woodblock print. Um, it's an extraordinary one, I think. The Great Wave of Kanagawa, the artist is Katsushika Hokusai. This is the same artist that did the woodblock of Fuji, uh, Mount, the Red Fuji uh, that I showed you a few minutes ago. Um, now, because they used water-based inks rather than oil-based inks like they do in the West, water-based inks are thinner, as you can imagine, and so therefore can be harder to control. You know, watercolor in many ways is harder to do than oil painting, for instance, because the paint is harder to control. You know, you can do phenomenal things with it once you really develop the technique, but it's, it's harder to sit down and do serious, uh, serious art in watercolor, in my opinion, than it is with even oils or acrylics. But um, this is a case where by using water-based inks, they not only get brighter colors because the oil based inks tend to be um, more dense, darker, but they also get are able to get glazes and transparencies and various other kinds of things. Now, this kind of image, for instance, is multiple wood blocks that are used in overlays and each of them inked in a different color. That's how they get you know, all of the all of the different blues that are associated in this and then the browns in the boat and that sort of thing. Those are different layers of colored uh, where they will ink the blocks and imprint them over top of one another. Um, it's a similar process in terms of that kind of layering as they do in uh, seriographs, that is um, silk screens. So, uh, but there are many different styles of this woodblock printing. There are some that will be just black and white, obviously, and there are some that will have a single color that will be used as an accent, uh, much like sort of hand-colored mono, uh, monochrome prints if you've ever seen in the West. Some will use two colors or then you get the multicolor, multi-block prints that have to be registered, meaning they have to make sure they line it up right or the colors you know, won't, won't fit in the right areas. Um, and so th this is absolutely one of my favorites. Um, I really like uh, Hokusai's work. Um, Are they drowning? I, bet I love this <laughs> Yeah, no, they're fishing. I never could figure out if they were drowning. Now, I, these, are, these are supposed to be fishing boats, but they just run into a huge wave. Okay. Uh, now, uh, we don't know what happened on the other side of that wave, so I don't know if they drowned or not, but um, I guess that's part of the question you, you can answer for yourself. So woodblock printing is a f very highly developed art in Japan. Now, the oldest of the Japanese arts, and I could have started with this, is ceramics. Um, again, the oldest signs in most civilizations that we have of a subtle situ uh, civilization and of the development of human culture are pottery shards. Um, that in the oldest age that we have, that we have a name for in Japan, the Joman period, um, which is as much as 10 to 12,000 years ago, we have Japanese um, sculpture and pottery. This piece in the lower left here, that's a Joman piece, so that's several thousand years old. Um, and it, similar to the, to the pot that I showed earlier, has sort of rope-like designs in it. The, again, large Chinese influence through the fourth century, and then Korea influenced the ceramics as well. And in fact, the, in the 16th century, Japan tried to invade Korea twice. Um, this is called the Injun War they were kind of driven off. They actually were winning on land, but then a Korean admiral defeated the, the, the Navy of Japan twice, and they ended up having to retreat back. That was what sort of ended one of the, the shogunates and led to the start of the Tok Tokugawa shogunate right in the early 1600s, because it was right at the end of the 1500s the second time. Well, when they uh, invaded Korea in the Engine War, they took prisoner several thousand ceramicists potters and brought them back to Japan. 
and much of the style of ceramics in Japan comes directly from the influence of those Korean um, ceramicists that came over. In fact, we had one of our guides mention that to us, and you know, which I appreciate the fact they recognize that. Any of the, the white uh, ceramics that you see, and particularly the ones that, that have a sort of celadon that, with the green or the crackled finish, all of that was originally Korean, and it was adopted and changed and made uniquely, I think, uh, Korean, or uh, Japanese in that regard. But the earliest sculptures we have are simple clay sculptures, but then we get into the carving of wood, the use of metal. Um, a lot of them were for idols, again, for Shinto or Buddhist worship. Um, then you get later on very, very refined ceramics like, you know, like this, where you have a, a beautiful blue glaze and then three cranes, or like this. Uh, this is a tea jar where you have colored a glaze that's put on and then fired. So the Japanese ceramics today are considered amongst the finest in the world. They really are brilliant at it, and you can get some great deals. I got uh, a teacup that really, really like uh, at a store that we stopped at the other day, and it was the equivalent of about two dollars and twenty-five cents, you know. And it's handmade ceramic with a beautiful glaze on it, uh, so you can get some good deals, or you can spend ten thousand dollars on a really nice bowl or cup, you know, because there there is that level of artwork associated with it as well. Um, and one of the reasons that ceramics has always been so important to Japan is because much of their ceremonial culture, like the tea ceremony is oriented around the use of vessels. You couldn't very well have a tea ceremony if you didn't have cups and pots and you know that sort of thing. And those become part of the whole experience of the tea ceremony, which is a very important meditative um, ritual for the Japanese. And so because of emphasis and other aspects of their culture, ceramics have become particularly important to them. Um, Then we get into the written arts. I'm not going to talk about novels so much, although I mentioned Yukio Mishima uh, and uh, Masaku referred to him as uh, on our tour yesterday as uh, Mishima Yukio. You know, turn the name around. We, we in the West we usually call him Yukio Mishima, who committed seppuku in um, 1960, I think it was. Um, and great writer, the sailor who fell from grace with the sea. He also, uh, you know, he's written a number of other uh, wonderful books before he killed himself. Um, but the, so Japanese novels are quite, quite wonderful, but I want to talk about poetry for a few minutes. Poetry has always been considered a, uh, an important aspect. I told you that the samurai soldiers were expected to be not only literate and well-read, but they were expected to be poets. Before a samurai would commit seppuku, you know, before he would commit suicide for some failure, either he lost a battle or, you know, for whatever reason he felt like he had been disgraced and needed to regain his honor, before he committed suicide, it was expected that he would write a death poem. Um, and so the idea of writing poetry was inherent in anyone who was considered cultured, the samurai included in that. Um, and always written with brush and uh, ink not with pens or pencils. Uh, this is part of it. The Traditionally, poetry in Japan began with the two creator gods, he who invites and, and she who is invited, that is Izanagi and Izanami. I told you that the first time, according to the tradition, the first time they meet each other, she speaks first, which is completely wrong, you know, and, and can't have that. Because it's he who invites and she who is invited, not the other way around. So the, the, the full legend is that when they first met one another, um, Izanami said, what joy beyond compare to see a man so fair. Well, Izanagi freaked out, you know, that she spoke first. So they had to back up and come back around the world pillar, as it's called, and meet each other again, at which point Izanagi, who is not so creative, says, to see a woman so fair, what joy beyond compare. He got to speak first, but he's not very original. Anyway, those are considered the first poems in, um, in Japan. And so poetry became an important part of their culture. There are a number of different forms. Because China had influenced Japan so much, one kind is called uh, kanshi, which literally means Han poetry or Chinese poetry. It's written in Chinese characters. Then you have waka poetry. Waka is... is 
written in Japanese, it's the traditional Japanese style, but it can be in several different forms. One of the most common forms for it is called tanka, which is a poem of five lines with a meter of 57577. Five, seven, seven. You know what I mean by meter, it's the number of syllables or emphases that you have in each line, 57577. Seven, seven. And then of course, all of you when you're in elementary school probably had a teacher who had you write a haiku. A haiku is also a traditional form. It's a three-line verse form that the meter is uh, 575. Now, traditionally in Japanese, the haiku was intended to take two elements of nature and then some connecting word or words in between and compare the two or relate the two. Um, so, it, and always from nature. So that was very particular. Uh, the, the traditional kind of code for how you do these things, you know, I remember when I was in elementary school that our teacher taught us to write haikus. We wrote them about everything, you know, blackboards and, you know, whatever else. But traditionally, two aspects of nature that are connected by some word in, within the poem that are compared to one another. And that is haiku, and it is a very high art form, uh, no matter what we did in elementary school. So this is an example of a scholar with his brush and ink well and his, um, his paper here, contemplating nature out in the garden and writing, preparing to write poetry. Because this is an important part of what it meant to be a thoughtful, cultured Japanese person. And women, historically, women have been very involved in writing poetry. In fact, there's, there's a particular kind of women's poetry that historically, you know, for, for many, many hundreds of years has been among the favorite. Some of the anthologies of poetry that have been collected, and anthologies of poetry in Japan are very important, have been poetry by women. Because cultured women, women of the court, women who were well-bred, um, were considered that their poetry was, was very, very important. Um, and so they were recognized for that. Now the traditional performance arts I want to talk a little bit about no theater and then kabuki theater, two different kinds. Um, again, like so many other things, the original no theater, which is the, the uh, older of the two, in fact, no theater today is the oldest kind of theater that is still performed today, you know, of, of anywhere, okay? The, the, I mean, there may be some island uh, kinds of things that are done, but, uh, but in terms of a formal theater form, this began in the 14th century, so the 1300s, and they've been performing it ever since then. Um, it's traditionally, they would have five no plays, and in between each of the no plays, they would do a comedic play called a kyogen uh, that was funny, and you'd spend all day. You know, it was an all day thing. Um, nowadays, because cultures have changed, they typically, if you go to no theater, if you're you know, in Tokyo or something, you go to a no theater for the cultural experience, it's only two no plays with one Kyogen uh, play in between them. They're always based upon stories from traditional literature. Usually it involves a supernatural being who's been transformed into a human hero um, and that narrates the story. It includes ghosts and women and children and the elderly and, and um, they use masks a lot. And I'm fascinated, one of the things that they do, these masks down here, that's one mask lit the same way, taken at three different angles. And you see the difference in, in apparent expression. The one on the left almost looks like the person is laughing. The one in the middle looks like they're, you know, frightened or something. The one on the right looks like they're very upset. They will use masks like this and they're so carefully designed that depending upon the attitude of the head, they communicate a different feeling both in no and even more so in kabuki, there are traditional expressions of the face and of the hands that are meant to represent very specific kinds of emotions. Anger has a certain look, uh, passion has a certain look, and those are codified, they're traditionalized, so that when, when someone takes that stance, you know what it is they're representing. Again, they use a lot of, in no, they use a lot of dance. It's a, a dance and music form, as is Kabuki. There are masks, costumes, lots of props, stylized gestures. It's very, there's a, a code. They have codified how no is to be done and what the expressions are and how it's to be presented, and it's closely regulated. So it's a, in one way, it's a very tight form. Um, 
the stage, which you see at the top here, this is actually, and you can't really see it, it's too dark, this is an actual uh, no performance. But on a no stage, there's the central stage, there is an off-site entrance, there's a band in the back, which is the standard form, there are a chorus of players over here that will sometimes, you know, interact with the, the main performer who's on the stage, and so it's very formalized. And all stages, no stages, are supposed to be formed like, made like that. Um, then we have the one you may have heard of, whether you know much about it or not, Kabuki, which is, again, another classical Japanese um, dance drama. It's very stylized. Kabuki is then known for the very elaborate makeup, the white face makeup and the various, uh, very um, colorful costumes. Kabuki literally means the art of singing and dancing. Another way to translate the word kabuki is avant-garde, meaning it's a, this was when it started, um, and it, it began in the 17th century, 1600s. The, uh, it was considered real cutting edge. You know, this was different. This was unlike anything they'd experienced before. Now it seems quite old-fashioned to us, I guess, but it was, it was very avant-garde when it started. The original um, kabuki was called ono kabuki, and it was entirely women. It started, it was invented by a woman, and it was always women. But the performers in ono kabuki were, the women were then, after the performances were available for prostitution. So when the shoguns came along and took over and the military discipline and everything was sort of driving the country, they didn't care for that. And so they, they forbade Kabuki from being performed because it had there was a sexual uh, aspect to it. Well, when they outlawed the, the female Kabuki, it got modified during the shogunate period to be all male, and all of the parts, men, women, and children, were all played by adult men. And this was called Yaro Kabuki, and to, that's the tradition uh, still today. the The stage uh, for Kabuki, which you see here features sort of runways. Um, these are called hanamachi, that are projections from the stage where people can make entrances and exits and sometimes the performance is done there and so the audience is kind of in the middle of what's going on frequently. Um, the uh, kabuki is almost always in five acts. The first act sets up the plot and the characters. The um, second and fourth acts usually have some kind of conflict or even a battle. The third act has some major revelation, and then the fifth act is the one where everything gets resolved, usually very quickly. And the way, the way they write Kabuki is it starts out slow, kind of introducing you think, to it, and then the principle of ha, as they go through it, it gets faster and faster until finally they reveal at the end. And so these um, sudden dramatic revelations or transformations is a huge part of it, and because of that, because uh, transformation revelation is part, they do a lot of stage tricks, and they always have. I mean, there are trap doors, there are uh, various other kind of stage functions, and again, in modern times, they've been able to do even more of that, but they have stages that are on, uh, that will pivot so that they can introduce a, very quickly introduce a completely new scene, characters whose costumes are ripped away by a, a stage hand, so that all of a sudden you realize there's somebody else, uh, they're not who you thought they were, and appearances and disappearances, they even, um, from a long time ago, have what they call chunori, which means literally riding on air. They would have ropes, wires, um, and people would fly, you sort of Peter Pan, you know, on these stages in Kabuki. And they still do that because of the sort of dramatic uh, reveal that somebody is not who you thought they were and they're able to fly away. Um, ten, they tend to be either history plays, dramatic stories of uh, domestic life. Or there's a particular style called the love suicide plays where it's a Ro Romeo and Juliet, right? Um, kind of thing. Or they are purely dance pieces and they can be any of those styles in Kabuki but quite beautiful. The costumes, the makeup, uh, the, the special effects that they use are quite something. Three other forms I want to mention quickly that you, some of you have actually practiced very recently. On the left hand side here is paper folding. Uh, the word origami literally means folding paper. Traditionally, origami started with a square piece of paper and it's folded with no cuts, no glue, no markings in order to create 
Um, paper crane is the most popular. I use this image because talk about a fancy paper crane. You know, this is all just folded. None of it's cut. There actually is a separate art form called kiragami, uh, which is closer to Chinese paper cutting. And in kiragami, they, they can cut the paper as well as fold it. But in origami, there's no cutting or gluing. Um, and so the idea of creating um, sometimes things like cranes or other animals, sometimes simply creating beautiful effects. And I don't know if you've noticed in recent years, the number of times when you go to a fast food place or if you go anywhere uh, and you get a package, you know, you get, you get a box from Amazon and you take the stuff out of it and you realize, man, there's no glue on this, there's no staples on this, the thing is just folded in such a way that it holds together, right? They discovered a number of years ago that the skill of origami could be put to industrial uses. And it, it, they, they now design those packages by origami artists, people who have an expertise in folding paper, so that they don't have to use any fasteners and people can very quickly just sort of fold together a box. Even bankers' boxes started doing that. You know, you, you, they, you fold this flap, they have instructions. Fold this flap in, and then that flap down, and then this flap down, and then that flap down, and you can put 60 pounds of boxes of books in there, and it's not going to fall apart. Well, those are the kind of things that origami has taught the industrial world. Um, and so it's a fascinating kind of field. The second one I'll mention in the upper right is ikebana. Ikebana is the Japanese art of flower arrangement. Ikebana literally means living flowers. It's sometimes called kado, which means the way of flowers. This art goes all the way back to the seventh century. Are you familiar with ikebana? Have you seen the Japanese? Uh, they, they're extraordinary. I mean, they, they don't use formal balance nearly as much. I mean, that most of the Western, um, and I have nothing against Western flower arrangements, but most Western flower arrangements have formal balance as part of it. You know, if you've got a white lily on the left side, there'll be a white lily on the right side of the thing. Whereas to achieve the aesthetic without formal balance is really kind of the key in Japanese flower arranging. Um, starting in the seventh century, they've been developing this. There is now over a thousand different schools of ikebane, uh, in not just in Japan, but in other parts of the world as well. So a thousand different approaches to how to do this kind of uh, flower arrangement. If you're not familiar with Ikebani, check it out sometime. Maybe if, you, if you're in Tokyo or Yokohama or something, go in a florist shop and see what they have that is uh, Ikebana because they're really extraordinary to look at. And then the lower right side, which is the only one I've really, ever really you know, uh, had a chance to participate in, is bonsai. I actually took some classes and was doing bonsai for a while. Bonsai, which literally means tray planting, is the art of taking a, uh, a plant and modifying it, that is by directing the trunk, by trimming it, etc., so that it gives the appearance of uh, the, the proportion and appearance of being a full-size tree. You know, this tree right here is like 12 inches tall. Um, and so the idea of creating, back to the idea of the gardens, you know, the, the Japanese gardens, I'm gonna talk about gardens just briefly in a second, that the idea of presenting something as though it were completely natural, of working very hard at it, but coming up with something at the end that is beautiful because it looks so natural. The idea behind a bonsai tree, and that's not bonsai, it's bonsai, B-O-N-S-A-I, that the, they have the proportion and shape of full-size trees, and yet um, they'll be very tiny. The art is over a thousand years old. There are bonsai trees that I've seen that are hundreds of years old. You know, that they, they, these small trees can live, if they're taken care of, for a very long time. The bonsai artist that I studied with for a while said that he's had on several occasions somebody take a class and they work on a bonsai and they take it home, they don't take care of it, and they, it dies, and they bring it back and go, do something. And they go, what do you want me to do? He said, well, fix it. It's dead. You know, you can't fix it if it's dead. You let it die. You know, but so keeping them alive can be a challenge, but bonsai is a, a beautiful art form. Um, all right, let's talk briefly now about Japanese architecture. You've been seeing a lot of that. Um, traditionally, Japanese architecture is based entirely in wood structures. They may have a stone foundation. Some of the castles you've seen will have stone up to a certain level in order as a defensive measure, you know, so, uh, but typically they are wooden structures in Japanese architecture. They are usually built off the ground. They'll be on short stilts or in some other way off the ground. 
Uh, the roofs are tiled or thatched. They will have layers of um, the of the wood, cypress bark, that will be layered in order to create the thatch kind of effect. In in England, for instance, they they will use you know various kinds of grasses that they will thatch. Here, they use bark from trees. Um, the Japanese architecture that will feature sliding doors called fusuma in place of walls. There will therefore be um, the support will be posts. You know they will have posts or pillars and then joists that run across that. They do not have, um, generally speaking, and some of the castles probably those exterior walls were weight bearing, but within the typical um, house in Japan, there are no weight bearing walls. It's entirely held up by posts and then beams, joists and beams. So um, within the house, they have sliding screens called uh, shoei that divide the interior spaces so that you can have larger spaces or smaller spaces. There are cushions typically to sit on the floor rather than chairs. Um, the flooring is almost always tatami mats, you know, which, which you, you've seen those, right? That's why you take off your shoes when you go into a, a Japanese house or a Japanese building. Um, so the typically the fanciest part of the whole thing, the inside will be very simple, you know, very straightforward. Uh, not a lot of ornamentation, but the roofs tend to be much more ornamented. They have a gentle slope. Chinese roofs tend to have a sharper sort of up curve, but they will have a gentle curve on them, and they just the tile that they use and the you know the end pieces on the gables and things tend to be very spectacular. So the roof is the most showy part of the whole thing, the most complex and intricate part of it. Um, the the houses are typically built, traditionally built, according to a uniquely Japanese measurement called a ken. A ken is just under two meters, like one and nine eleventh meters is what they figured it out to be. It's the size of two tatami mats. And so when they talk about rooms in a typical dwelling or a castle or whatever, they will say this is a 12 mat room. What that means is that it's six ken, meaning because a ken is two tatami mats. And so the tatami mats are so important that that actually creates a form of measurement for them when they build their buildings. Um, now, there are differences in terms of ornamentation. Um, the tea houses or buildings inside a traditional Japanese garden tend not to be as fancy. They tend to be, even the roof lines are simpler and they're back away from the center of things. There are exceptions to that. How many of you went to see the Golden Pavilion in uh, Kyoto? Okay, that's the golden pavilion, and that's real gold. That's gold, they, they put gold leaf on that. In fact, they just redid it a few years ago, and it's now thicker than it used to be. This, because it's right on the water, and because of the ornamentation, this is more of a Chinese style, and it was designed for that. It's not a traditional or typical um, Japanese style of building. It was originally a residence. Later on, the son of the builder turned it into a temple which it still is today. But you will notice in these examples that the ornamentation is on the outside. Um, there is an upturned roof, but inside the buildings, oh, this is another example of ornamentation. This is a temple. This is all carved in very great detail. But then when you get to the inside of these buildings, that's what it looks like. You know, this is a typical home. Um, there, will be, there will typically be cabinets if the futons that they sleep on will be put away during the day in large drawers in the cabinets. The cushions that they sit on will be put away when they're not using them. And so typically you might have one or two very low tables. You don't have any chairs in a traditional Japanese home. Of course, modern Japanese homes look just like ours, uh, the various apartments and things like that. But this is very much what you get. And this is based upon a Taoist concept that really has influenced the aesthetic of Japan. And in Taoism, they talk about the aesthetic of emptiness. The idea that if you don't have a lot of ornamentation inside, that you are free to create much more from your own imagination what you want your space to be and what you want it to, to fulfill for you. So they're very well built. It's they're, they're, um, a lot of craftsmanship going to building these things, but there's not a lot of ornamentation. So they build them well, but they build them very simply. And all of this is consistent with the idea of a respect for nature. And again, according to Taoism, there's a sense in which that impermanence is a strong feature. Everything is movable. 
um, everything is removable. Nothing is, you know, if you've got a baby grand piano, you can't move it around a whole lot, right? But the idea of impermanence is you don't have furnishings that you can't move. You don't have anything in the house that you can't move. If you want to remodel, you get a new wall hanging or a new flower, and you have remodeled, okay? Um, it's pretty straightforward and pretty simple, and, uh, and there's a real beauty to it. Our house is much more, uh, even though it's a Mexican house, it's much more English clutter, right? You know, there's, there's stuff everywhere. Um, I'd love to be able to do this uh, someday. Also, in terms of colors, um, they tend to be, inside and out, natural color schemes that tend to be black, white, off-white, gray, or brown. Not a lot of bright colors. The, um, the idea is simplicity. The idea is to have a place that doesn't excite you, but rather calms you in your house in the same principle as having a garden. And speaking of gardens, most of you heard the lecture on gardens, so I'm not going to talk a lot about it. This is a good example of a Zen garden. The stones represent, um, they could represent the earth, people, and the sky. The, the white gravel, you'll notice that it's raked. It's raked in the Zen garden as an act of meditation for the monks that are responsible for caring for it, and frequently it's raked in such a way as to represent water, because white gravel or stones. Again, if you went to the Golden, uh, the golden Pavilion, again, how many of you did that? So I don't know how many of you talked, okay. As we left the Golden Pavilion, we walked back up the hill, did you notice on the right-hand side, there was what looked like it should have been a water trough, you know, a natural, with stones, but there was no water source. That was a brilliant example of using stone to represent or to symbolize um, water flow. Now they had lots of water in other places. You know, they had several ponds, they had waterfalls, they had all kinds of things. But this was an example where they had created with stone the impression of moving water. And so often they will use gravel or stone to represent that. Um, and again, the idea behind these gardens is to suggest ancient, faraway, natural landscapes to, uh, to represent the passage of time, the fragility of existence. Um, somebody asked me why they didn't have more flowers. Well, you, they sometimes have flowering trees, but I actually got a better answer for that than one, the one I gave. Flowers to the, uh, historically, especially to the samurai, the daimyos, represent um, short life, because flowers die. They don't last very long. The reason they, that's why they don't use flowers, because these were military people, frequently. They use evergreens, which are a symbol of uh, living forever. Um, and so the gardens tended to be evergreen trees, evergreen bushes, trees, that sort of thing. You might have a flowering tree somewhere, but you don't have flower beds because flowers were a symbol of um, the temporal, you know, the temporary aspect of life uh, that you, you weren't going to last long. So uh, that's why you get all of this greenery and all of the more bamboo and plants that will pretty much live forever. Uh, okay, any questions about any of those art forms? And all of these are art forms, including the gardens. I mean, these are really seen as, there are experts in this that are considered, you know, maestros, terrific, uh, fine artists. Yes? I have no idea. Um, he asked me what the calligraphy said. I don't know. Now, frequently what they will do is it will be a poem or it will be um, a sutra, you know, a religious writing or a mantra. So usually it will be something that has some, some aesthetic appeal for its content as well as its visual. But the calligraphy itself is, is you know, they're oriented toward the visual. In terms of what they'll say, I don't read Japanese or Chinese. Somebody else said that they thought I read Chinese at one of the stops, and I went, uh, no, I don't. <laughs> no, I just pulled it off the internet. Uh, yeah, so these, these are you know, just images to give you samples of what we're talking about, so. Other questions, yes? Well, comment, I think everybody would be familiar with the incident that happened on 9-11 when the World Trade Center was damaged by right. a plane, plane flew, fell, the plane flew through a wall and the building fell down. Yeah. All the weight, they made a mistake when they designed the building, all the weight was on the walls. Yeah. No columns, they wanted maximum space inside. No columns, all the weight, the floors were kind of hinged. Right, that's, 
the design, of, he's talking about the fact that when the airplane flew into and through the building at 9-11, that it led to the building collapsing because the support, the way skyscrapers were made, they're like an exterior cage that holds the building up. And the guy well, that invented- Those, high, those yeah. skyscrapers, not the old ones. Yeah, well, the, um, the guy who invented modern skyscrapers, like tall skyscrapers, yeah. I guess that's what a skyscraper is, is tall, um, <laughs> he, he invented them because one time he, he was, had a bunch of books he was moving and he piled them up on top of his, his birdcage. And then he realized he had like 60 pounds of book on, books on top of this birdcage and yet it hadn't collapsed. And he started thinking about working on the idea of having an external frame, metal frame, that could support the weight. And that's how skyscrapers were invented. But there is a downside to that. And that is the downside to any weight-bearing wall is you compromise that wall and things come tumbling down. You know, uh, I've known people who, without thinking about it, decided, or knowing what they were doing, decided to cut a doorway in a weight-bearing wall. Does not work well. Um, not unless you make specific arrangements to continue to support it by putting a king beam on top of it or something. Other questions? Yes? Are tatami mats are same size? Yes. Uniform? Yes. Tatami mats, at least, I mean, not the kind you buy in a 7-Eleven to go to the beach, but tatami <laughs> mats that that are, you know, the formal ones are all exactly the same size. They are one and nine elevenths meters long and the, and the same width. And the reason is because they originally, they, you know, they called it um, like six feet in ancient Japanese measurement, but that comes out being a little different. It's, it's uh, not, not exactly six feet according to us, or not exactly two meters. So it's just slightly less than two meters long and then about half that wide, uh, but that's, it's, a, it's they build their rooms to an exact measurement based upon how many tatami mats will fit in there. So, yes, other questions? Boy, either I told you everything or I told you nothing. Yes? Right. Uh, how do you go from this kind of art to anime or manga? Um, I don't know what the particular steps were, but the development, I mean, a lot of that is Western influence. There's a particular style, if you look at anime, that is, is uniquely Japanese. I mean, the, the, the way the characters are drawn, um, it doesn't look like Western cartoons. Um, and so there is that, that representational element, but it's heavily influenced by, by Western uh, graphic novels, by car, you know, comic books, and all of that sort of thing. So I think you get the Western influence, and then sort of a Japanese stylized form. Um, they're trying to accomplish the same thing: provide a colorful, illustrated entertainment, usually for younger people. Although some adults get into anime and stuff as well. Um, and so I think that they've they've sort of added that the Japanese stylings to the Western idea of a comic book or an illustrated uh, novel, and you get anime. I can't tell you any more than that in terms of the specific steps, but I know we've got we've got uh, great nephews that just nuts for anime and manga, um, and some of that stuff gets a little adult for you know younger nephews. Yes, in the back. What about plumbing? <laughs> Well, again, in more modern times, they would they would have plumbing, and of course, you've seen uh, traditional um, Chinese and Japanese plumbing, and the traditional Japanese plumbing is just the same. What about those new toilet seats, though? Right? I think we've talked more about toilets on this trip than any any time in my whole life. Uh, the typically what they would have is an outside toilet in the historic ones. They would not be inside the house, and in that regard, it would be very similar uh, to. You know, my grandparents, neither one of my grandparents had indoor plumbing. You know, they had outhouses and they had a spring that they got water from. And so I think that's very much the, the way it would have been done traditionally in the old Japanese homes. Of course, in modern ones, they would put in indoor plumbing. Um, and, it, and again, the sort of transition would be a pit toilet, you know, uh, rather than a seat toilet. But uh, typically it would have been something that was outside rather than inside the house. Now, there, there are old examples, and if you go to Ephesus, for instance, they have an example of a public toilet that has the toilet seats still there, and they had arranged for water to flow underneath those toilet seats so that all the waste got washed away. 
you know, and so there may have been examples of that I'm not aware of, but I don't want to, you know, you know, exclude that possibility. There may have had some sort of system like that in some of the Japanese dwellings as well, because it goes back a long, long way. Yes? But Roth, one thing that's intrigued me about so many of the castles and monasteries things which is they pay a lot of attention to rain drainage. Mm -hmm. Almost all of the, the buildings will have, will have drains right, right along the drip lines, the roofs, and French, what we could now call French drains. French drains. Path. I mean, they pay a lot of attention to that, much more sophisticated than you see in American dwellings. Right, say. well, it, it, that's true. Uh, his comment is that they clearly had a lot, paid a lot of attention to water drainage. You know, there are, um, I noticed sheets of lead that were used as flashing, mm -hmm. you know, over the, the, uh, the tiles that had been, you know, the, the laminar tile kind of thing, uh, which would have been waterproof, and the overlapping of things with um, gutters and drains and French drains, which a French drain is basically a pipe with holes in it that, that will collect water and, and move it away so that you don't get, uh, well, there was a good reason for that. Um, these are wooden buildings. If you don't make arrangements to get the, to keep the water off of it, or if water gets on it to allow the water to drain off of it quickly, then you pretty soon have got a rotten building. And so that was a big reason why they did a lot of that. And the reason that the, um, because they obviously had no air conditioning or electricity for fans or anything like that, all of the buildings have very wide eaves because that shaded uh, the building. It shaded the, the, along the edge of the building, it shaded the windows so that you didn't get as much heat from the sun. But yeah, the reason for all of that um, very intricate kind of drainage things is that since every building is built out of wood, the only time they would use stone is for a foundation or for a defensive fortification. <laughs> Otherwise, everything is wood. And so even though they're using um, woods, like in the case of Cypress and others, that tend to be fairly water resistant, um, it's it still, if you didn't make arrangements to get the water off of it, if it's raining, then you're going to end up with having to rebuild your house. So th that's a big reason for that. Well, thank you all very, oh yeah. Right. It's amazing how clever they are. Because you know, on the ramp, usually we don't put any drains until it gets to the bottom. Mm -hmm. And they have them like, you know, in section, catching right. the water, draining. It was a gentleman said, you know, just draining them away. Yeah. To, to alleviate kind of all Exactly. The all the pipes coming out of the concrete, you know, so that they're not yeah. getting, you know, water behind that even yeah. to, to compromise yeah. the concrete yeah. banks. Like, you know, Good. Thank you all very much.